Any positive reputation Russia's airborne had has basically gone out the window. In the first few weeks of the invasion of Ukraine, it's well known that certain VDV units got mauled and failed to capture the cities of Kyiv and Mykolaiv. And the Ukrainian government has claimed some divisions and brigades have had to pull back to Russia to be rebuilt. But that begs the question, what is the actual purpose of the VDV? Why do they use different equipment from regular Russian ground forces? And what are their units like? First, the VDV's purpose. As a whole, all VDV units have a focus on air mobility and quick reaction. Traditionally, they've always been a more elite brand of infantry, and a force that could be committed to crises when normal ground forces couldn't. The specialist modes of entry for the VDV are parachute assault, air assault by helicopter, and air landing whereby an advanced force captures an airfield and follow-on forces are landed by plane. However, in reality, more often the VDV actually acts as elite armored infantry from the ground. As we go over their force structure, it'll become apparent why this is problematic. The two main types of VDV units are the Airborne and the Air Assault, which includes Specialist Mountain Air Assault units. There's also Spetsnaz Special Reconnaissance units, but that's out of scope for this video. Airborne and Air Assault units are organized similarly but with subtle differences. Doctrinally, airborne troops have always been a strategic asset used by the Russian general staff at the national level to conduct parachute operations. In the context of a conventional war, this means paradropping deep behind enemy lines, probably towards the end of a conflict, to capture or destroy key command and control nodes, lines of supply, airfields, political targets, and enemy nuclear weapons. They've also historically been used for quickly establishing a Russian presence in an area as a reliable force directly under national control. Air assault forces, meanwhile, have had a more varied history. They're somewhat heavier and more oriented to supporting operational forces. In a large-scale conflict, they theoretically deploy either directly in front of ground forces in their security zone or a relatively short distance behind enemy lines to capture key terrain and tie up the enemy's reserves ahead of the supported ground force. Up until the early 2010s, some air assault brigades were actually under the control of ground force military districts, but they've since been consolidated under the VDV. Currently, Russia's airborne forces has two air assault divisions, the 76th and 7th Mountain, three air assault brigades, the 11th, 31st, and 83rd, and two airborne divisions, the 98th and 106th. There's also the 45th Spetsnaz Brigade, which is essentially for special reconnaissance, special operations, and intelligence gathering. Elements of all these units have been deployed to Ukraine. Now for the organization, we'll start from the bottom. First, the Air Assault or Airborne Platoon consists of three airborne infantry fighting vehicles. In most cases, BMD-2s armed with a 30mm autocannon and ATGMs, or the BMD-4M, which adds a 100mm rifled gun. As of the end of 2020, the newest BMD-4s have been delivered in 9 battalion sets to the 106th Airborne, 7th Air Assault, and 76th Air Assault Divisions, as well as the 31st Air Assault Brigade. But the BMD-2 remains the most common platform across the force. Due to the limitations of air-droppable vehicles, they only offer scant protection and a small carrying capacity. The platoon as a whole is under an officer platoon commander and consists of three squads. The first squad is led by the deputy platoon commander, typically a mid-level NCO, while the others are led by sergeants. One of the squads only has six men to accommodate the platoon commander, while the other two squads are seven men. All squads have their respective squad commander, who usually acts as the vehicle commander, as well as a driver mechanic and gunner. The gunner acts as an assistant vehicle commander and takes over command of the vehicle when the squad leader dismounts. The two larger squads will have a dedicated four-man dismounted element as well, including a senior rifleman sapper armed with a rifle, a PKP machine gunner, an assistant machine gunner, and a rifleman who command the vehicle's ATGM. The smaller squad, meanwhile, only has three dedicated dismounts other than the squad commander, including the senior rifleman, and instead of an MG team, a two-man RPG-7D team. This leaves the platoon with a total of 14 dismounts, which is extremely small for an infantry platoon. Three of these platoons make up the close combat element of a company. In both air assault and parachute companies, they'll also have a nine-man company headquarters carried in an infantry fighting vehicle and BTRD or BTR-MDM airborne APC. 
Air Assault companies will also have a grenade machine gun section carried in an APC. This doesn't mean an automatic grenade launcher like one would assume though, rather they serve an NVS heavy machine gun and two RPG-7D rocket launchers. Three of these companies form the core of a VDV battalion. Both types come under a battalion headquarters and staff transported by a signals platoon. The battalion doctrinally has a recon platoon with two IFVs at its disposal and is supported by a support platoon and medical section. Pictured now is how a parachute airborne battalion would look, but the air assault battalion differs in two ways. First, the airborne battalion's support platoon has dedicated airdroppable trucks, and second, the air assault battalion has a 6-tube 82mm mortar battery, which in practice would be motorized. These battalions are subordinate to brigades or regiments depending on the context. In Russian practice, brigades are independent formations with more self-contained support, while regiments are subordinate to divisions. Air assault regiments generally have two air assault battalions and one airborne battalion supported by an 18-tube Nona S self-propelled mortar battalion, an anti-tank battery, an anti-aircraft missile battery, sniper company, and service and support companies. Since 2021, both of Russia's air assault divisions, the 7th and 76th, have been brought back up to three air assault regiments after having been at two for some time. Since the late 2010s, the divisions have also had one tank battalion equipped with T-72 B-3s to bolster their firepower and hardness. The division is also supported by an artillery regiment, generally equipped with 18 Nona S mortars and 12 D-30 howitzers, as well as an air defense regiment, recon, engineer, communications, and material support battalions, a medical detachment, and airborne support, electronic warfare, and UAV companies. Airborne divisions differ from this in a few ways. First, the Airborne Regiment has three Airborne Battalions rather than a mix of Airborne and Air Assault. Second, Airborne Divisions also still only have two Maneuver Regiments during the making of this video. And third, Airborne Divisions lack the Expanded Tank Battalion of the Air Assault Divisions. Air Assault Brigades, meanwhile, are generally similar to Air Assault Regiments but with some discrepancies. A general model for the brigade is basically a regiment but with an additional towed D-30 howitzer battalion, a reconnaissance battalion rather than a reconnaissance company, and a T-72 B-3 tank company. Additionally, some sources claim that the 11th and 83rd Air Assault Brigade's two Air Assault Battalions were equipped with the BMP-2 IFEs common in the ground forces rather than BMDs as late as 2018. They were, after all, originally subordinate to the ground forces until transferred to the VDV in 2013. However, it's unclear how up-to-date or accurate that claim is after their resubordination. By contrast though, the 31st Air Assault Brigade, which was part of the VDV from the start and was notably mauled north of Kyiv, is fully BMD equipped. In terms of how these units have been deployed in Ukraine, it looks like each regiment and brigade size unit has been generating about two battalion tactical groups each. The VDV's BTGs are at their core a reinforced infantry battalion. Reinforcement varies quite a bit, but doctrinally, it could include an artillery battalion or battery with Nona S gun mortars pushed down from the regiment or division levels. However, each regiment and brigade only has one such battalion, so if deploying more than one BTG, a single battery is probably more likely. Divisional artillery won't necessarily directly reinforce a BTG in all cases, especially if an entire division is deploying. In addition to artillery, they may be reinforced with an anti-aircraft platoon, ATGM platoon, sniper platoon, sapper platoon, flamethrower platoon, electronic warfare platoon, maintenance platoon, and material support which means supply trucks. Although not available to the regiment, additional assets could be attached from higher up, including tanks, special forces, and heavier artillery and air defense assets. However, not all BTGs are created equal, and some may actually be much smaller. For example, this is alleged to be the Manning and Equipment Readiness Table for the 2nd Battalion Tactical Group 108th Air Assault Regiment, 7th Guards Air Assault Division a couple weeks before the war. It paints a picture far different from the doctrinal example, and in terms of personnel, the BTG is only manned at 75% of TONE's strength, at 403 men versus the full authorized 538. 
the chart marks out a battalion's worth of BMD-4M infantry fighting vehicles and BTR-MDM APCs, as well as a battalion command APC. No manner of supporting artillery, air defense, or tank support is listed. To be fair, we don't know the full context of the chart though, and it could have been reinforced later. Alternatively, the unit could have been operating under the auspices of a regimental tactical group, or directly under a larger VDV grouping that retained those supporting elements. But even so, the core of this already small unit was only at three quarters strength before the war, let alone after entering combat. And that personnel readiness figure is a perfect segue into our section on limitations. As a caveat, we aren't arguing that the force structure alone has caused the VDV's poor performance in Ukraine, as there are a lot of other factors at play, like tactical proficiency, low-level initiative, flexibility in decision-making, and the enemy's own capabilities. But force structure and equipment inherently limit a unit's capabilities, and when there's an incongruence between the force structure and the mission, there can be problems. When talking about the VDV's doctrinal specialization in airborne insertions, heavy mechanization has its trade-offs. Strategic mobility is a big factor because although infantry with airborne IFVs have considerably more direct fire support and operational mobility than foot infantry, those vehicles have to be supplied and maintained. They also put far more pressure on Russia's already limited aviation park, since one IL-76 can only lift about a platoon's worth of BMDs with no room for paratroopers. AN-124s can lift more BMDs than an IL-76, but this is a far more limited platform. To carry just one Russian airborne company would take about four IL-76 transports for the vehicles, plus another IL-76 for the troops. And this has nothing to say for any other kind of supplies that has to be dropped in a pallet or something like that. Our Lord and Savior Michael Kaufman estimates Russia's aviation park could likely only airlift two or three battalion tactical groups in one go. So the utility in having four divisions and three brigades with airborne mechanized capabilities is questionable. Compare this to the Ukrainians, who instead of maintaining a large VDV equivalent they couldn't use for actual airborne operations, converted most of their air mobile forces into high readiness mechanized infantry equipped with modernized BTR-4s and T-80BV tanks, leaving only one airborne brigade armed with BMDs. Now, theoretically, there are valid arguments either way for or against some sort of airborne fire support vehicle, or something to carry troops from the drop zone to short of the objective. These are not inherently eastern concepts, although they haven't been employed in the same manner in the west. For example, in the future, the US Army basically wants to do something conceptually similar but in two different platforms. The infantry squad vehicle for the operational mobility side, and the mobile protected firepower for the fire support. However, we can't help but feel that the impact on airborne operations is purely academic, since the VDV aren't really being employed that way in practice. When considering the VDV's actual combat role as armored infantry is when their issues become more glaring. The limitations imposed by their airborne IFVs pretty much means the VDV Infantry Company is one of the smallest around, with about 48 dismounted personnel at full strength. But if that 75% readiness figure from earlier is anything to go by, you could be looking at more like 30 to 40 dismounts per company in real life. This is more akin to a platoon rather than a company. For comparison, a standard Russian motor rifle company on a BMP will probably have about 66 dismounts at full strength, while an American mechanized infantry company will have 84 give or take. And these are heavier mechanized forces. An American airborne infantry company will have 117 soldiers in just its rifle platoons, not counting mortars or the company HQ. This effectively means when it comes to dismount-centric tasks, like patrolling urban terrain for example, companies will essentially have the fighting power of a platoon. Granted, they have their vehicle's firepower, but in some situations this could be more of a liability than anything, like in many of the pictures of VDV columns ambushed when passing through a village or a suburb. In this terrain, the vehicles suffer from poor situational awareness, and less infantry means fewer men to provide dismounted security or clear buildings. The vehicles themselves also have little protection, mainly against small arms and artillery shrapnel. That limited protection though could be enough to lure infantry into a false sense of security as if they were riding in a proper IFV, when in reality, BMD armor is more comparable to an up-armored Humvee. This could explain some videos and photos that point to a death-before-dismount mentality during the first few weeks north of Kyiv. 
This wouldn't be the first time Russia's been punished by their poorly protected airborne IFVs. VDV units deployed to Afghanistan in the late 1980s traded in their BMDs and light trucks with BMP-2s and BTR-70s, while ASU-85 airborne assault guns were sometimes swapped out for T-62 main battle tanks. This isn't to say, though, that more tanks and heavier IFVs would necessarily have improved the performance of the VDV, since Russia's premier armor forces also did relatively poorly in the first month of the invasion. It's more so to highlight that the VDV force structure exudes the worst elements of mechanized infantry and light infantry in one package. Worse protection and less sophisticated combat support than a Russian motor rifle unit, and 30% less bayonet strength. Ultimately, the VDV's force structure is an inheritance from the Soviet Union, when visions of deep battle airborne thrusts into a defeated NATO were a credible threat. However, it's clear that these visions are now fantasies, and Russia is relearning the critical vulnerabilities its airborne forces have suffered when fighting the wars that Russia actually fights. If you enjoyed this video, check out this video on the origins of the VDV, back when it was the first large airborne force in the world. We'll see you over there.